Welcome to the Purpose-Based Retirement with Certified Financial Planner, Casey Weed. Casey is the president of Howard Bailey Financial. Whatever risk you face during your retirement years, we've got a plan. A published author and radio host. It's not how much we make during the good times, it's how much we keep during those really bad times. His advocacy for retirees and pre-retirees has made him a sought after speaker and trusted financial leader. And putting a real plan together. This is the Purpose Based Retirement. Welcome back, investors. Good to see you again. I'm Lee Kelso here with Casey Weed, Certified Financial Planner and the President of Howard Bailey Financial. Hey, all you Stephen Covey fans will like our first segment today. We're going to be taking a look at the seven habits of highly effective investors. And uh, our viewers are going to be hitting us with some questions. And one of them I think is pretty interesting. What do you do with the proceeds from a lake cottage when it sells? We'll talk about that in just a few minutes, but let's get to those seven habits. I think that's something that many people can relate to. And, and you kind of borrowed. These are not Stephen Covey's suggestions, right? right. These are you applied yeah. his seven principles to investing. Yeah, I mean, his seven principles, I read that book a number of years ago. He passed away a number of years ago. And, and I found that a lot of those things that had a big impact in my life, those seven principles, principles uh, could also be applied to a lot of the, the people that I meet with on a daily basis. I've met hundreds if not thousands of people over the years who have been very successful in their financial lives and most of these principles that are applied to maybe more of the the day-to-day -day things that you do in your life can also be applied to your investment principles and how you treat your life savings and so I want to take those seven things apply them to your financial life and I promise you if you follow these seven guidelines you're going to be well on your way to a successful retirement someday and be able to live throughout your retirement years very comfortably with a peace of mind. Well, let's jump right in with number one, and that is take responsibility yourself for your investments. Yeah, that may be, it might seem kind of obvious, right? Yeah. It's our responsibility, but you wouldn't believe how many folks that I meet with that want to always blame somebody else for giving them this investment vehicle that performed poorly or they didn't like or they're not on the right track. They want to blame the government. They want to blame the econ economy. They want to blame their financial advisor. It's always somebody else's fault. And the buck stops with you. It doesn't stop with anybody else. It's your responsibility to get yourself on the right track and also to make sure you're evaluating and you're in the right place that you're taking time to educate yourself and make those decisions for yourself. It's nobody else's money but your own. Let me give you an example. Marshall told me a story of uh, a gal that he met with uh, a while back and he said when she came in she spread everything out on the table in front of him and said look these are all things that I had 401ks and IRAs and mutual funds and stock portfolios and she said this thing right here and this is the thing that, that just eats me up. It's the worst thing that I have and he took a look at it and as he popped it open it was a fixed index annuity that she bought back in 2009 2010 time period and she said it's just awful well when she put the money in there she got a 10 percent bonus and then everything was moved into a fixed fixed interest account and so it was only making about one and a half percent a year as a fixed rate mm -hmm. now had she had that allocated appropriately to the index why it was purchased as an index new in the first right. place it was put in the s p 500 she was getting an 85 percent participation rate so getting almost all the gains of the market over that period of time would have resulted in about a 10% average rate of return since the time that she bought it till today, not including the bonus. And so, but she would get that, that statement in the mail every single month and she would look at it and go, well, this, and this might be what you do. You look at the statement, you get frustrated, say, boy, that, that's, that's really bad. And you throw it in a drawer and you don't look at it. Instead, if you take responsibility and say, why is this bad? Take the time to understand it, get a second opinion, make sure everything's where it's supposed to be. You're filling in the cracks of your financial life. You take responsibility. Now it also gives you the feeling of empowerment and peace of mind because you know what you have in the first place. It's important also to uh, jump in, get started, and put time on your side. Explain that concept. Right. You know, I, I don't believe in these get-rich-quick schemes, but a lot of people want to they want to buy a handful of stocks. They want to double their money over the next year or two. They want to see if they can make as big a rate of return as they possibly can, and sometimes they go awry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think 
for the most part, the people I see with it have done the best job saving and gotten to where they're at. They took their time. They consistently saved. They didn't hit any home runs. I mean, I can show you people that have made thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, not real high income earners, not six figure income earners, that have more saved today. I had a couple that I met with that were probably making forty, fifty thousand dollars a year at the peak of their earning years. They get to be sixty, sixty five years old. They've got over a million dollars in a savings account, making next to nothing. And then I can show you different people that have had a half a million dollar annual income that get to retirement that only have a few hundred thousand dollars to show for it. It's all about consistently saving, protecting your nest egg, remembering the number one rule of investments which Warren Buffett developed. Rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. And almost everybody that I meet with is in that boat that we just need to protect that life savings, do the right thing, use common sense, and we'll be on the right path. Here's another one that seems obvious, but it's kind of difficult to execute for some people. And, and you put it this way, to get ahead, get organized. Yeah, let's get ahead, let's get organized. And that's something that we just don't do because we get caught up in just our work lives, our daily routine, taking care of our families, and we forget about the assets that we've saved and what the purpose of that money was when we first started saving in the first place. And what I would encourage you to do is take a look at what that money really means to you, separate it out into three separate buckets. We've got your rainy day fund, have that established for the rainy day. Maybe this is in money market, stable value CDs, uh, maybe short-term fixed annuities or some type of high-grade investment-grade corporate bonds. And then we have our conservative portfolio. So we've got our emergency fund, which we have extra cash in. We can pounce on opportunities. Our, and then we've got this next portfolio, which is going to be our conservative allocation for near-term income needs, the things that we might need over the next 10 to 15 years. And then we've got that third bucket, which is our Explore portfolio. We're focusing more on long-term growth. We might have a little bit more fluctuation. And this is really what the purpose-based retirement's all about, is setting specific purposes for all those dollars so you can make sure that you're on the right path. We have our emergency fund, our core portfolio, our Explore portfolio, and then we fill in the cracks with the tax planning, the health care planning, and all mm -hmm. those other pieces. So why is it important that I think global? Well, I think sometimes we get stuck in investing just in the U.S. And we need to realize that there's a lot of opportunity, especially today outside the U.S., especially in the equity markets. The United States, out of 35 different countries, is about 34th, I believe, on the most expensive uh, countries to invest in in the world when we're looking at a valuation standpoint. Mm -hmm. We can get valuations that are a third outside the United States um, over what we can get here in the United States in some of the same sectors. But they got telecommunications. We might look at AT&T and Verizon in the U.S., look at, say, Vodafone or Telstra outside the United States. There's a lot of opportunity outside the U.S. as well as inside. But I have to be careful in that, don't I? You do, and you need to make sure you set some guidelines in place as well, and that's the next principle, right? We want to make sure that we have some guidelines for what we're going to do and make sure that we're not... Um, I want to say uh, be over concentrated in any individual position. This is especially um, apparent for a lot of the individuals that have employer stock inside their 401k. Let's never have more than 5% in any individual equity, so on and so forth. So have some guidelines. And quality and value, the Q and the V that without the C right. that, that is so popular. There's right? a lot of great quality out there, but we have to look at what we're paying for that quality as well. And so United, inside the United States, we might sign, find some really high quality equities today, but at the same time, they may be overvalued. So the price we pay is very important. So there you go, the seven habits of highly effective investors. We hope that helps you out and steers you in the right direction. And I also hope that you'll be one of the next 10 people to pick up the phone and take advantage of our special offer today, a complimentary financial review of your entire financial and retirement plan. It's an opportunity to give you an education about your money so you can make the very best decisions for yourself moving forward. So for the next 10 callers, Casey and the team at Howard Bailey are willing to make time on the calendar, sit down with you, and give you your very own purpose-based retirement. When we come back, we're taking calls from viewers. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Casey Weed, a certified financial planner practitioner and the president of Howard Bailey Financial. Do you feel that your financial professional should put your interests above all else? Well, I do, but Wall Street doesn't. While lobbyists seek to delay a universal fiduciary duty on all retirement accounts across the financial services industry, you can begin working with an advisory team that's ahead of the curve. Don't you want to work with someone who puts your interests ahead of their own? 
If you said yes, then give us a call today. You need a plan for retirement to create the lifestyle you've always dreamed of. The first step is to tune into the Purpose Based Retirement Radio Hour with your hosts, Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson, every Saturday morning at 11 and Sunday afternoon at 1 on 1190 WoWo and 1075 FM. Every now and again, we take calls from viewers, questions that come in through the week. We evaluate them and then reach out and ask those people to be part of the show with us. And today, Becky is on the line. Becky, go right ahead with your question. My father would like to begin passing his inheritance on to my sister and I, but I'm concerned that he may not be making the right decision. He owns a lake home at, that he purchased about 30 years ago on a prominent lake, and he's wanting to sell it for about 400000 and split the cash between my sister and I. What are your thoughts on that? Well, Becky, thank you for your question. And uh, my thoughts on that, that are, number one, that we want to be careful about selling these assets prior to his passing. And it sounds like this is later in life. Uh, someday he wants to pass these assets on to, to you and, and uh, your sibling and make sure that those things pass on to you in the best way possible. One of the th main concerns I have are what kind of taxes are going to be due when that does occur in Indiana, especially northern Indiana, and, and all over the across the country for that matter we've seen huge increases in the values of lake property and and huge increases in lake property all over the state so regardless of where that property is I'm sure there's a great deal of appreciation over the last 30 years you may have a cost basis that's less than a hundred thousand maybe as much as forty or fifty thousand dollars in that house and so if he were to sell that property today there's going to be capital gains taxes that are due so he's going to have long-term capital gains taxes that end up being paid we know that there's going to be a about a 15%, maybe as high as 20%, maybe throw in Medicare surtax, maybe there's up to a 23.8% uh, tax altogether on the sale of that property, on the gains. So if you have a $100,000 basis, we've got a $300,000 gain, then that means that we might have $45,000 in taxes due on the low side with just a $300,000 gain if he were to pass away, if he were to sell those properties today. Instead, if he s waits and until he passes away and then you inherit the property, there's going to be a step up in cost basis. So at that time, that basis that was 100000 has now stepped up to 400000 and we can sell that property without paying any major taxes, like those long-term capital gains taxes that we talked about. So be careful in what you're doing. Now, it also have you weigh, well, what are property values going to do in the future? And this is one of the things we look at with farmland today. Farm prices have went through the roof over the last 15 years, and we say, well, why is that? Well, it's a completely different reason that farmland prices have went up versus uh, uh, lake property. Now, yes, there are limited amounts of those properties around, and that's part of the equation, but the big reason is just why the bond market has gotten so expensive today. As interest rates have continued to fall, people have looked for places to put those dollars in places like yielding uh, cash rent uh, from a farm property from that land, and that is why some of these prices have gotten to be so sky high, and people are yielding only 2 or 3 percent, and many cases in their rent on their farmland in, in relation to the actual valuation or the price of that property. And so when we evaluate that sale for a piece of farm property, and you may be doing this for yourself as well as you uh, watch the show, should I sell my farm or should I hold it? We look at that differently than this uh, piece of real estate that's on the lake because those valuations can fluctuate. It's income producing property. It could drop quite quickly. So maybe a 10 percent, maybe a 15 percent tax on a piece of farmland, we say, well, the price could don't go down 30 percent over the next five years, so I'm comfortable with going ahead and paying those taxes in lieu of the risks that I'm taking. So just bottom line is here, weigh all those different risks that you have, all the potential uh, gains that you could have by waiting or selling it, for selling it today, and make the best decision for yourself. I would also encourage you to consult with a CPA, a certified public accountant, for some tax advice. Thank you for your call, Becky. We're going to go roll ahead to Dennis, who retired recently. Dennis, what's on your mind? Uh, yes, thank you for taking my call. I retired about six months ago, and I'm feeling a little bit lost. I've always had a direction in my financial life, and it was, it was pretty simple, straightforward. Save, 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 and let it grow. Uh, now I find myself a little lost as to what direction to take. So what should be my next steps? 
Well, Dennis, I think a lot of folks can probably relate to that. When you first step into retirement, we're a little lost, right? We're not sure what to do. We used to wake up in the morning and have to be to work at 9 o'clock, and then we'd head home at 5 o'clock, and the goal was just, just work and make as much money as we can and save and put it in our 401ks. And now, Dennis, you've stepped into retirement, and you're six months in. And this is typically the most stressful period of time. This is that first year to 18 months, typically, until we kind of settle into retirement. And one of the ways you can work towards settling into retirement and you should if you're not yet retired for any of you out there watching make sure you're doing this before you get to that point we we're saying well what do i really want to accomplish it why do i want to retire in the first place what's the purpose of the money that i've saved today and what do i hope to accomplish in my personal life over the next 10 20 or 30 years we always have to have goals we always have to have a purpose for our life you have to sit down here dennis and spend a little bit of time focusing on goal setting and that may seem weird. You say, well, I don't need to set, set goals anymore now that I'm retired. But that's what's going to drive you. That's what's going to drive your financial life. That's what's going to drive how you allocate those dollars in your financial life. Where do you want to be in 10 years? Where do you want to be in five years? What do you hope to accomplish over the next six months and 12 months? And what do you want to happen to that life savings once you've left this earth? Dennis, good for you. I hope to have that problem one day. How about that? Uh, Diane, go right ahead with your question for Casey. My husband and I have always had good income in the low six figures, so we always thought it best to defer our taxes. Now that we are about 10 years from retirement, all of our savings is in our 401ks. Is now the time to begin building up our Roth savings? Boy, that's such a difficult question to answer, Diane, because as you said, you're in a higher tax bracket. You're a high income earner. So now you've got all the savings built up in this 401k and you ask yourself, what should I do? Because when you put that money in your 401k, you defer the taxes into a later date, at which time you hopefully are in a lower tax bracket. I would give you this piece of advice. Typically when we convert to a Roth or we use a Roth IRA, we want to be in a lower tax rate environment today than we're going to be when we start making those distributions. But if they're going to be the same, it might make sense for you to go ahead and start doing some of those Roth conversions or making some Roth contributions so that you can build up some flexibility, some tax-free savings once you get to retirement. This is a combination of a lot of different factors. I have a gentleman that I worked with this past week who had about a million two in his 401ks. He's 62 years old, trying to make the Social Security decision. Am I going to take Social Security today? And now that I've got my entire savings in my 401k, what are taxes going to look like? Well, he's going to be in the 25% tax bracket when he gets to be age 70 if he delays any distributions from his 401k because he's going to have these big old required distributions that push him into the 25% bracket. So we're going to go ahead and lock in at the 25% bracket over the next eight years about three hundred fifty dollars to $400,000 in tax-free savings so that we can dramatically reduce his required distribution and control what taxes he's going to pay. If he wants to go buy a lake property in the future, talked about moving to Florida and getting a house, if we want to go get a couple hundred thousand dollars now, he doesn't have to worry about paying 30% or more in taxes on that 401k distribution because he's already locked in a lower tax rate on a big chunk of it. So not a perfect answer, but yes, you should start diversifying your tax buckets for the most part, but it's going to take a deeper dive into what your goals are and all those other income sources. This is just one piece of the financial puzzle you're trying to put together for yourself and your family. Thanks for your call, Diane. And if you'd like to potentially join us here on the program with a question, just email info at howardbailey.com and we'll hope to talk to you on a future episode. And if you're just joining us, I hope you'll be able to take part of our special offer today and be one of the next 10 people who call right now. It's a complimentary financial review of your entire financial and retirement plan, an opportunity to learn more about your money so you can make really good decisions for your family and yourself moving forward. So for the next 10 callers, Casey and the team at Howard Bailey will make time on the calendar sit down, visit with you, and provide your very own purpose-based retirement. Our question of the day, major market losses before retirement are known as what type of risk? Sequence of returns risk, red zone risk, retirement date risk, or market loss risk? The answer when we come back. You don't walk into a doctor's office for some blanket prescription for whatever ails you. You expect individualized attention a doctor who listens, and a treatment prescribed to meet your specific need. When it comes to your financial future, why expect anything less? 
If you would like an independent checkup from an independent advisor with access to hundreds of possible solutions to help you meet your goals, contact us today. You need a plan for retirement to create the lifestyle you've always dreamed of. The first step is to tune into the Purpose Based Retirement Radio Hour with your hosts, Casey Weed and Marshall Johnson, every Saturday morning at 11 and Sunday afternoon at 1 on 1190 WoWo and 1075 FM. Heading into the break, we asked you our question of the day, and that was major market risks before retirement are known as what type of risk? Major market loss, I should say. There are the choices on the screen, and which one is correct, Casey? Well, we would say that the answer to that question is something called retirement date risk. And retirement date risk is the risk that begins to occur around that retirement red zone. So the time right before you retire and the time right after you retire is called the retirement red zone. The decisions you make at this point in your financial life will impact whether your retirement succeeds or fails over the next 20 years, next 30 years, or the next 40 years. Whatever that time period is, this is the most important time during your financial life to truly understand where you sit and have a plan for the worst. And so when we get to this point, we look at it as a retirement red zone. We have retirement date risk before retirement, sequence of returns risk after retirement, and it's all due to one potential risk, and that's market loss risk. So market losses during this period of time, major market losses during the retirement red zone can lead to declining portfolio values and what? Violating the number one rule of investments, which is buying, you're supposed to buy low and sell high. If we begin to take distributions while the market's down, now over the last 10 or 15 years, you've been through a couple major recessions, the portfolio's recovered, maybe because you didn't need that money. Now that you need it, you may violate that number one rule of investment and have sequence of returns risk. This is all due to something called the portfolio size effect. So if we take a look at the size of that portfolio, when you first started saving for retirement, it was very small. So every contribution that you made had a big impact on the value and the fluctuation of the value of that portfolio. As you got closer and closer to retirement, that portfolio got larger and larger. And so more and more of the changes in the value of that portfolio were not due to your contribution contributions, but we're actually due to market fluctuations. So market fluctuations become more and more important in that portfolio as we get closer to retirement due to the size of the portfolio and the timing of when we're going to need those distributions. When we look at a 25-year-old that just got started saving for retirement on his way or her way to a 65-year-old retirement date, now we see that between the ages of 55 and 65, we're at retirement date risk. And the portfolio is starting to peak at one of its largest values right before we begin to take distributions. For the following 15 years, we're entering a period of time called sequence of returns risk, where any major losses could put our retirement at jeopardy because now we're taking distributions from that portfolio. So how do we deal with this? Well, one of the ways that we've dealt with this very generally, if we pop open the CFP textbooks and look inside, we find something called the rule of 100. And this is something that we use to gauge how much of our portfolio goes to fixed income and how much is allocated to equities. So if we're 60 years old, we have 60% fixed income, 40% equities. We're 65, we're 65% fixed income, 35% equities. So we're adding just an additional percentage of fixed income every year on our way to retirement. And that results in a linear curve. So we're looking at a straight line. There's been some more recent research that suggests that we should have more of a declining or a V-shaped equity glide path. This yellow line here shows us how we should be declining our equity exposure on our way to retirement. But once we actually get to those first 10 years before retirement, we should be greatly reducing that exposure in more of a sharper curve. So we've got this V-shaped equity curve. It takes a sharp dive, then we begin spending some of that fixed income, and it begins to increase how much equities are making up of the overall portfolio until we get to more of a normalized equity allocation later in our retirement years. And that may seem counterintuitive to what you're used to seeing. Now we're actually incre increasing our equity exposure in those later years of retirement or actually those first 10 or 15 years of retirement. Well, let's put it another way. What we're creating is we're creating this inverse, what some people might use would be bonds or fixed income. This would be an inverse bond tent. So this bond tent means that 
we're increasing our bond exposure dramatically over those first few years, and then we begin to spend down that fixed income over the following 15 years. The first 15 years of your retirement are what are known as your go-go years, as my finance professor used to call it. Before you enter your slow-go years and then your no-go years, you're probably going to spend more income in that first 10 or 15 years doing things, traveling, going and doing the things, playing golf, spending time with friends, the things that you always wanted to do and the reason you wanted to retire in the first place. This is why it's so vitally important we protect that first leg of income. So ask yourself this question, are you prepared for the worst? Have you put together a plan? Maybe you find yourself five years from retirement or five years into retirement. If we have another major recession in the next five years, the next year, the next 10 years, are you insulated against that risk? So are you prepared for any retirement date risk? And are you insulated against any sequence of returns risk at the same time? So it sounds like you're, you're encouraging me to increase my bond exposure. Doesn't that create an interest rate risk as well? It could if we're buying bond funds. And there's a big difference between buying bond funds and individual bonds. So we may want to eliminate that interest rate one way by using individual bonds and getting a fixed income over a fixed period of time, maybe shorter duration bond, individual bonds today. Mm -hmm. Or we may look at alternatives. Uh, high grade corporate bonds and high grade treasuries are paying very very low rates of return today, or we have to go way out on the yield curve and buy very long bonds. Mm -hmm. What we can do instead is we can look towards alternatives where we can generate a consistent income, maybe with a greater degree of safety, where you're not going to get that from your broker, your guy that's selling you your stocks and bonds, or your gal that's selling your stocks and bonds. You need to find someone that's multifaceted in what they can offer you, a place that you can go pick up three to six percent with principal protection with a shorter term, maybe five years, maybe 10 years, those places are out there today. We just have to get more creative in who we're working with and make sure we're working with someone that can offer us all the tools that are available once you get to retirement. Because as I stated, there's never been a more important time for you to understand all of the options that are available to you and how they can be best used to give you that peace of mind that you seek during retirement and you frankly deserve. You know, I don't know about you, but I, I don't feel qualified to evaluate that kind of a risk. What, what do you do to help me? How do you figure that out? One of the ways we do when we first sit down with a couple, we're going to stress test that portfolio so we can put it through a series of tests where we can say, what if we have a bad year next year? What if we have another major recession next year or the year after that? We can stress test it, put it through some bad times before retirement, after retirement, and then that'll tell us what the end result's going to be and if we really have a problem in the first place. Well, I hope that you're one of the first uh, people to jump on the phone and one of the next 10 people to jump on the phone right now and take advantage of our complimentary offer. It is a financial review of your entire financial and retirement plan, an opportunity to learn more about your risk factors and your money in general so you can make the best decisions moving forward. So for the next 10 callers, Casey and the team will make time on the calendar. Sit down visit with you and give you your very own purpose-based retirement. Of course, you can always learn more about Howard Bailey Financial by visiting the website. It's howardbailey.com. Feel free to mail your questions to Casey at info at howardbailey.com. And who knows, we might call you up and invite you to join us on a future broadcast. And there's a new version of Casey's book available online as well, the 2017 Guide to Retirement Efficiency for the Purpose-Based Retirement. It's available for pre-order at howardbailey.com. We'll see you next time.